I'm here in Dana Point. Did you know that Dana Point was named for Richard Henry Dana? He arrived here in 1834, having sailed from Boston on a tall ship named the Pilgrim. He traveled around the tip of South America and then up along the whole entire coast of California. And he called this area, Dana Point, the only romantic spot. Well, he also wrote a book about his two-year experience called Two Years Before the Mast. On today's program, we're going to introduce you to some aspects of Dana Point that you may not know about. So, I'm here today at the Ocean Institute of Dana Point, uh, and I'm speaking with K uh, Kristen McGowan, who is the maritime manager here at Dana Point. Uh, she has a big job of managing these two fascinating vessels. So, Kirsten, maybe you could uh, tell me a little bit about what, your, what is your job and um, tell us a little bit about what you do. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, as you said, um, we have two amazing vessels here um, that really are a great educational platform. So, a lot of my job is um, the education side of the uh, maritime as well. Um, so, we've got the spirit of Dana Point behind us here. Um, so, in normal um, conditions, pre-COVID, we would have students on here doing dockside living history programs, day programs, overnights. Um, so, I'd be in charge of all of that. Um, as well as we do day sales um, for students, as well as the public, um, mm -hmm. which we are hoping to start uh, soon in February. Uh, so that's kind of the spirit aspect. And then we also have the RVC Explorer, uh, which is another great vessel. Um, that is a research vessel. So we use that for all of our science programs that we have. Um, so most science students, when they came here, would uh, go out to sea and to see that marine life, because um, we really have such a great um, marine life ecosystem here for them to explore and just um, on both of these vessels getting the students and public out at sea and just experiencing being out at sea is um, magical. I mean I know that's one of my favorite things. You know I find it fascinating that you have a background in history and part of your job is to bring that history to life of what it was like here with these early vessels. Children that do the tours and the adults from sea shanties to um, actually having them spend the night on the vessels and all of that. What other kinds of things do you do? You do? Yeah, um, I think that's one of my favorite parts um, as a historian um, for the students, um, you know, bringing to life some of that local um, and California history, right. uh, you know, the ex exploring California, the different eras. So one of our most popular programs is based off um, two years before the mast. Um, so fourth oh, graders um, yes. all read that book and then they experience it. And uh, some of them even, you know, say like, they're like, wow, you know, this, this is what it would be like yeah. and um, full on live that experience. And I think that's one of the unique things about our programs is they're living history programs. Mm -hmm. So our staff are all in character. Oh. Um, I'm Mr. <laughs> Mac when, when I'm oh on the programs, because obviously historically, sure. uh, women weren't um, on ships. Now there were some women that um, did dress up as men, and there's a whole history. Um, there are women on ships, but um, just to be accurate, but majority, um, most were men. So we you know, recreate that time period um, and bring the history to life because history is so much more than just dates, but it's a story. Oh, um, absolutely. So they kind of get to experience a story and then fifth graders um, do that Revolutionary War program. Okay. Um, so they get to be a privateer in the fight against the British. Ah. Uh, so they uh, go and try to deliver supplies to General Washington. Oh my uh, gosh. <laughs> yes. Now is that when they spend the night on the boat? Mm -hmm. So okay. both are uh, day programs. You have day program and overnights, and okay. both of them have the same um, living history aspect. Um, the overnights just go even into more depth, and they mm. have that night watch. Um, oh. you know, you're talking about have waking up at 3 a.m. Oh, um, that, that was that my, <laughs> my grandson when he was in the fifth grade. Yes, he spent the night on the pilgrim, and he got the 3 a.m. watch, and he will never forget that, I can yeah. tell you. Yep, and we've even had um, adults and public that come visit us that have spent the night on the boat really? and they bring their kids back, which is neat. Tell them about that experience um, and but, then they can do have it on their own right. as well. But there's so many details that really help to bring it to life. I'm sure the 
what they eat, the kind of food they eat. Mm -hmm. You sing sea shanties. Oh, yes. You, <laughs> you do all sorts of fun things. It is a fabulous, fabulous opportunity for kids and adults. Mm -hmm. I understand. I understand the spirit of Dana Point here has quite an interesting history. Can you tell yes. us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, Spirit has quite a unique history, um, kind of a good local history. Um, so if some of you have been around um, in the 70s and you heard of this crazy guy building a boat in his yard that was the Spirit. Huh. Um, so Dennis Holland, um, he's not crazy, he was actually an amazing person. Um, I met him and his family and they are just amazing people. Um, but, you know, his neighbors probably weren't too happy with him. Um, <laughs> but uh, he was a shipbuilder, um, and he built this. He got the plans, um, built it all in his yard. Um, now, I, I, now, this was not an experiment. He, he obviously has done this before. He knew what he was doing. He's built other ships. Um, and how long did it take him to build it? It took him 13 years to build it. <laughs> Kristen, tell me a little bit more about the research vessel and, and what goes on there. Yeah, so um, the RVC Explorer, um, our research vessel, is really quite um, an amazing boat. Um, so it's, as a research vessel, we have a lot of different um, tools that kind of help us to engage with the public. Uh, we do some of this on our public trips, um, as well as school um, groups as well. We mm. um, do mud grabs, so we go out and we uh, drop <laughs> into the ocean and pick up mud and the kids get to actually uh, sift through the mud and see what um, they can identify from oh. the bottom and what we can learn about the local environment. Well, I, I thank you so much for taking the time to fill us in on what you do and this is a fabulous place. I hope our viewers will take advantage of it and head down here to Welcome to another segment of Beyond the Gates. I'm Bill, and I'm here with Elaine, and we are here at the Dana Point, Dana Point Interpretive Center. And uh, just a real quick personal note, it was about 20 years ago, the late 90s, that my wife and I traveled here from New Jersey and came to this point, looked out over here, and said, this is a great place to live. And Elaine, you know that. Yes. Uh, just the, yeah. the trails that are here, just an easy walking uh, trip from, you know, Laguna Woods is just a phenomenal place to come walk. I mean, uh, are these trails associated with many other trails around? Uh, they're not connected, but Orange County does have trails everywhere, everywhere. Every town you could go to, you'll find trails for sure. But from the interpretive center here, you can get to the many trails and say around Dana Point uh, easily get to. Yes. Um, is, was this part, was, was this trail around the, the, the center here um, a part of a, a reserve system within California? Yes, it's, it's actually a nonprofit organization called the CNLM, uh, the Center for the Na Natural uh, Land Management. And they own 29 acres here, which is now reserved. It cannot be built on. And they were endowed by a very generous uh, philanthropist. Mm. And it is for in perpetuity. This will be maintained. So nothing will be built on these headlands at all. Isn't that part of a whole land land management system of the coast of California? Is it included they do now, own property in other areas, yes. But it is a nonprofit organization. It's not the actual state. Now, I mean, you can come up here uh, and do these trails. You can't come up here at night. I mean, it's pretty much closed at right. night. Right. It's closed at sunset. Yes. Now, if, uh, if somebody wanted to find out exactly where the trails were here in the area, is there a, can they go to a website? Yeah, I would suggest go to um, the Dana Point website and you'll get a lot of information about what's available here in Dana Point. And of course, Orange County uh, has all kinds of yeah. trails everywhere. A lot of them are along the coast. The, the, the elephant here is new. <laughs> do you know what the name of the elephant is? I don't know the name of it, but I do know that several years ago, Dana Point had uh, an elephant season, so to speak, and there were elephants that were designed and painted by local artists that were located all over the city. Oh. And here and there, everywhere you went, you would see uh, an elephant, and I guess this is one of the ones that came from that exhibit. Okay. Obviously, there's some restrictions w with COVID now. Yes, um, there are. Is is this trail that we're standing? Is this open? 
It's open, however, what they have changed is the protocol as far as direction. It mm. only goes in one direction, similar to the way they've done that uh, in grocery stores for a sure. while yeah. and other trails that I go on. Um, the problem here is the entrance slash exit over here that you were referring to, it's right. only an exit. So you cannot enter here and then walk around and then come back here. The entrance is way further away and not even on this particular property. Property. It's down yeah. by, a, by, by the beach down there, Yeah, it? it's probably in the other part of this area, the Strand area. Okay. But, I mean, once COVID is finished, you can park here. Because, I mean, that's why I've done this trail yeah. several times. You can park up here by the... the uh, um, I'm going to call it the reserve center, but it's the interpretive center. <laughs> and then you can uh, just yes. walk through here, uh, yeah. which is, you know, so just keep an eye on the websites and you'll be able to find out when exactly the trails are open fully. Now we're going to go see some other interesting parts of this system, aren't we? Oh, welcome back. Elaine and I just <laughs> hoofed it down from the interpretive center. It's really not that bit of a walk. But uh, where are we standing here? I mean, this harbor is, is Dana Point Harbor, but what is, is this? What is this where we're standing? Yeah, what well, is? Well, we just have a really good view from this outlook onto the harbor for sure. And the trail that goes adjacent here is the Harbor Point Trail? Yes, it is. Yes. Okay. Now, the harbor hasn't always been here. That's I mean, right. when, when was this developed? Uh, they started building it in 1968 and completed it in 71. But wasn't it a really cool surf spot here yes. before they put in the. Yes, it was. History will tell us that there was a very, very um, famous surf spot called Killer Dana right here uh, below these cliffs. And uh, it's gone now. And they Killer Dana? It. Yes, Killer Dana. Does that say anything about the surf that's here? <laughs> it, was a, it was a good surf, apparently. Um, let's take a walk on the, on the trail now and take a sure. look at some of the, the interesting points. Sure. Elaine okay, and I have come further down now, the Harbor Point Trail, and uh, it's by the history plaque. I mean, how much do you know about the history of Dana Point Harbor, the whole area? Well, the whole history is based on a book that was written by Richard Henry Dana in 1920s, I mean, the eight, I'm sorry, the 1820s, 1830s, when he was out here on a ship from Boston. And at that time, there was nothing here. But he did mention the headlands where we are standing now hmm. when he uh, came to Well, this when you area. say there's nothing here, I mean, where there are orange was groves. All, all, no. Well, not even that yet. No, it was all ranches. It okay. was all ranches. And they were coming here to get the hides from the, sh from the animals, okay. the animal hides. This was all developed in? 68 to 71. I mean, and there's a beach over here. And now let's go see what Susan has to talk about today. I'm here today at the Ocean Institute at Dana Point. And with me here today is Jessica Brasher, who is Director of Animal Husbandry. Jessica, welcome. We're Hi. so happy to have you with us today. Oh, thank you so much for having us. Well, I'm just stunned to see what is going on here. There is so much. I'm remembering when I first moved to this area about 10 years ago and I'd heard of the Ocean Institute and I thought, what is that? Is that an aquarium or what is it? But anyway, it is much, much more than anyone would ever have guessed. And, and Jessica, I hope you can tell me a little bit, bit about what is the purpose of the Institute here, the Ocean Institute? Absolutely. So you are kind of on point. We are somewhat of an aquarium, but as you said, we are so much more. The Ocean Institute's main goal is to educate students about the ocean. Actually, our mission statement is using the ocean as our classroom. We inspire children to learn. However, we take that a little bit further, and we also offer programs for the public. Um, we do a distinguished speaker series, concert series here on site. Um, our whole goal is to encourage ocean literacy, to help um, inspire people to better take care and be better stewards of our local ecosystems. Now, during non-COVID times, this is a, a packed place. There's so many things going on, as you say, with children and adults and so much more. So how are you coping with all of this during COVID? Is any of it open? So typically we have school programs here, but with schools being 
off sites and mostly being virtual, we've had to shift and adapt. We're very fortunate that we have so many different things to offer both students and the public here. So we've been able to convert some of those to outside activities. Uh -huh. We've been calling it our inside out. We've been taking some of the things that we'd be normally doing inside our labs, bringing them outside in a safe environment. So that's included outdoor squid dissections. It's included tide pool hikes and explorations, geology tours, kayak tours of our harbor. And that's just only building and growing more as we're able to open up and offer more. Our right. website's constantly updating. Who knew? That is so, so much uh, it, that people can choose from, can participate in now, when the times when we're all supposed to be laying low. Absolutely. Right? And um, tell me a little bit about your, uh, the funding. Where, where, how is the Ocean Institute funded? So the Ocean Institute, we are very, very fortunate to have a lot of people that believe in our mission. So we have a lot of donor support. We also utilize grant support that can help some of the students who might be from schools that don't have the funding to send them on a field trip wow. and get those students down here to the ocean, sometimes to see the ocean for their very first time. Our volunteers make up a huge factor of our Ocean Institute workforce here too. So we have a huge team of very, very dedicated people that are able to come in and help us do woodworking on our tall ship, help us take care of the animals and clean tanks, help us educate the kids, and that is another huge source for us too. Students living in the area in Dana Point, the Ocean Institute is a huge part of their education for kids growing up in this area. I mean, they I do remember they would have, a, the fifth graders would have a sleepover on the, the, the uh, tall ship, mm -hmm. and you still do have sleepovers and educational programs for local students in, in your amazing array of, of buildings here. Okay. Not only do you have this wide variety of, of programs for children, for schools, for adults, but you also have two research ships, is that correct? So we have two vessels located right here um, on our dock our Maddie James Seaside Learning Center. So we have our research vessel, uh, we call it the RVC Explorer. Okay. And then we also have our historic tall ship, which is the Spirit of Dana Point. Both of those are used for students um, and used in a lot of different ways. So through our uh, maritime history programs, we're able to kind of bring living history to these students. They get to take a step into the role of a Revolutionary War sailor, <laughs> take a step into, up into the role of Richard Henry Dana, who came oh. to Dana Point to participate in the cattle hide trade right. and get to learn through experiencing, get to haul long get to get salt air on them. It's such a cool experience. What? And then through our research vessel, students actually get to go out. They take their own plankton samples. They look under the microscope. And all of these things we also offer to the public when we do public cruises. You do public do. cruises. And you do charge for them. Correct. And there you have the, the people that lead the cruises then, are they marine biologists or who, who are these people? So the staff that lead these cruises are our knowledgeable um, docents that work here at the Ocean Institute. So all of these people have got an extensive training on marine mammals, on how to identify our local seabirds, mm. and they are just amazing at being able to spot and predict when whales are going to pop up off of our coast. Um, a lot of our staff here have advanced degrees in different marine science fields. We also have some staff that tend to focus a little bit more on history and museum <gasps> curator studies. So there's a little something for everybody and everybody's kind of been able to find a oh, niche that perfectly fits those really, interests. What a rich offering you have to share with everyone. Um, fascinating, um, what do I call them? You have some fascinating specimens in there. Um, sharks and uh, much, much more. My favorite, of course, was the octopus. Me too. <laughs> I had no idea an octopus could fit through such a small, small, say that again, octopuses can fit through What's the size of the, the diameter of a... a for what they can fit through. So yes. an, our octopus, our local species that we have here at the facility is a two-spot octopus. And a two-spot octopus has only one hard part on their body. Actually, any octopus has only one hard part on their body, and that is their beak. And that's located right in the center of all those arms. That's it's, their beak. It looks like a little bird beak, too, <laughs> but it's the only hard part on their body. And it's about the size of the eye of the octopus. So for a good kind of barometer, if you look at the eye of the octopus, they can fit through anything bigger than the size of their beak, and their eye is going to be about that same size. So our two-spot octopus's eye is about the size of a pea. It could fit through a drinking straw. And we just saw something like that. That's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. Well, what about the jellyfish? We saw some interesting jellyfish in the other room. Yes. Mm. Our jellies are one of my favorite exhibits here because our jellies are all bred in our house here. So most of our jellies we've known since they were the size of a pea or tinier. And the way that the jellies are actually born is one of the most wild 
things to me, and I love talking about it. So moon jellies, they actually have two different forms of reproduction. So a moon jelly, like you're used to seeing, the ones that are free swimming, okay. actually um, broadcast spawn. So they release a whole bunch of eggs into the ocean, and that's about as much maternal care as they get because <laughs> there's no brain. Um, hopefully one of those eggs gets fertilized. It'll settle down to the bottom of the ocean. It'll attach onto something at the bottom, and it grows into something that looks like a tiny flower but it's called a polyp, and that thing will be a polyp its entire life, but that polyp has the most important job in the jelly world, and that polyp's job is to make more jellies. Uh -huh. So it'll sit at the very bottom of the ocean and wait and wait and wait until the conditions are just right, and then it'll copy itself and copy itself, copy, 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 until you have a stack of little jelly copy pancakes, is what I call it. <laughs> now, once they're big and strong, and when I say big and strong, everything's very tiny at this stage, about two weeks later, that top one will wiggle, 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 pop off and free swim, pop off and free oh, swim. Just... Every single one of those little babies will turn into a big free swimming jelly, hopefully, except for the first original polyp who's stuck there oh, and gets no. to do the same thing over and over again. That's fascinating. But we call that alternation of generations. And the okay. way I think about it would be, if your grandparents were a free swimming jelly, your parents would be a polyp. So you'd be a free swimming jelly. Your children would be a polyp. Every generation flip flops. I love this. I love <laughs> Great description. Now, what about those stinging jellies? Because they, they sting, right, when you they're know, threatened? It's true. All jellies do sting. We're very fortunate that the local species that we culture here, moon jellies, their sting is extremely weak. Oh, so right. if you were a plankton, you might need to worry, but human skin, pretty tough for them. Yeah, oh, so. right. Let's talk a little bit about sharks. I understand you have a very special exhibit that was supposed to open, and maybe you can fill us in on Absolutely. that. Absolutely. So we were very fortunate um, to receive a grant from the Somme Family Foundation to create our new Somme Family Foundation Marine Education Center. And the whole focus of this exhibit is to dispel some of the myths and misconceptions that people have about sharks in mm. our oceans and help to show them some of the important roles that these sharks play. For instance, horn sharks, one of our local species housed in our new tank here, are crucial for our local kelp forests. They oh. are big, big consumers of our local purple urchins. Huh. And so when we end up uh, having overpopulations of these urchins, they like to eat the uh, base system of these kelp um, that live off of our coast. And once you uproot that kelp, it stops growing. And so urchins end up decimating our kelp forest oh, off of our coast. Goodness. So horn sharks, very important to keep them in check. We, we saw in the building next door a gigantic whale skeleton. Can you tell us about that? Where did it come from and, and what's the story there? So our whale skeleton, she actually has a name. Her name is Gracie, uh, <laughs> Gracie, and she is a California gray whale who would have only been about a year to two years old. So this one's still a oh. juvenile. So Gracie actually washed ashore locally back in the 70s and she was missing her um, caudal fins or fluke at the very end, which would be her tail. Oh. Um, so there's some suspicion about that might be the reason that she washed ashore. But uh, they were able to come down and preserve that skeleton and use that for our education program. So being a juvenile gray whale, the skeleton that you saw in that room is only about half the size of the adult whale. Oh and so gosh. to see a gray whale out in the wild, which our research vessel goes out and does marine mammal cruises regularly, and you get to see some amazing wildlife out there, but to get to see a whale of that size come up right next to you is just incredible. I can't imagine imagine that, just can't imagine some of your classes or even just to wander around. The, the grounds are spectacular and there is something for everyone here. Thank you again. Of course, thank you so much. So on that note, Bill, what are you up to? Thanks, Susan. When Dana sailed to what we now call Dana Point, this harbor was not here. Sitting here with Jim Miller from Coffee Importers. Now, Jim, I could go through your entire menu of all the great bagels and coffees that you offer, but you've got pages and pages of awards. I it's, do. It's amazing. The best breakfast, best donut, best sandwich. What's the organization for the best cure for a sweet tooth? Ah, uh, <laughs> this side here is our healthy side. We okay. do bagels, juice bar, wheatgrass, tonics, all those kind of things for people that just want something healthy. Okay. Or they want a sandwich or a salad or a bagel with breakfast, which is our most popular seller. Or we have our, across the way, we have our ice cream store called the famous Scoop Deck Ice Cream Store. So ice cream's not healthy? It's very healthy. <laughs> okay. As long as you don't eat too much of it. Okay. So when we have, there we have an espresso bar and pastries. Now, so, where was your original location? This has been a family business, correct? Family business since 1979. Okay. And it was right here at this store here, at that window. Um, but in 1979, my parents, we have a cousin, we have a cousin in Denmark who okay. wanted to open a coffee shop. 
and I was in Chicago running restaurants. Uh, and so they wanted me to help them open this coffee shop. So I partnered with my parents and they said, we have this place in Dana Point Harbor called the coffee importers we want to buy. So that turns out there was a German couple uh, that bought this store, in 19, opened it in 1975, mm -hmm. when the harbor first opened in 1975. Okay. And they opened the coffee importers and we bought it four years later. I see. From them down here. Now, how did your menu develop? I mean, you, you've got a pretty diverse menu for a coffee shop. I mean, it's delicious. I mean, well, that, yeah, that's 40 years of being here. Okay. So, what it started out was a gift store with whole bean coffees and one little tiny cappuccino machine and no pastries. Then my parents wanted to bring in pastries, so we moved the machine up to the window. Okay. And the pastries up to the window, and we started selling pastries and coffee. Mm -hmm. And then we put some tables and chairs down here in this little opening. And in a matter of a, m a month, my parents says it's too busy. We had we had to do more tables and chairs, so we got approval to put a patio put here. This patio wasn't here when we came. These, these were planters, so we put a patio here, and we opened the pad. This patio was built in 1979. Okay. And we opened the patio up. And within a matter of two months, the patio was too full. And so we started putting tables and chairs out here, and we are putting tables and chairs over here. And then eventually, um, we got approval to buy the store next door. Next door. And we put an ice cream store in. And we, that was half the store. I, I know from living in a village that a lot of people from the village like to come here. Just yes. to, to, to relax in the morning and just look out on the it's harbor. It's great. great. The shop. harbor is... The, this is one of the best harbors in all of California. I mean, in fact, it may be the world. I don't know. There's, there's nothing it's like this close. harbor. Because what you can do, you have three miles of flat walking that you can do here. Yeah. I mean, there's not too many places you can do that without getting hit by a car. You know? Now, what time do you open? We open at 7. At 7 days Every a day, week? Every day, 7 days a seven week. 7 days. Are you working 7 days a week? I'm not working 7 <laughs> days, but I am working 6. Now, um... Have you seen the show or aware of the show of, of uh, Jerry Seinfeld, the coffee in, in cars with coffee? Yes, yes. Has yes. he ever contacted you? No. No? No. <laughs> yes, I've had coffee here. I've had bagels, all sorts of things. And I know it's tough running a, a restaurant. And thank you very much for your time. And we'll see if we can get more people from the village here. Oh, yeah. Listen, this is a great place for people from Leisure World to come. It's The parking's free up here. Yep. I hope you've enjoyed our visit here to beautiful Dana Point. It's so close, only 11 miles. Why don't you come on down? Just turn south on Moulton Parkway. And we'll see you next time on Beyond the Gates. Mm -hmm.